Good morning, everybody. It's 8 o'clock. It's our uh, time to start this morning. It's great to actually welcome a group of people to this room. It's been a wonderful uh, thing to be able to open up and have the service that we're going to have this morning with folks actually in attendance. It seems like it's been a long time since we've been together. Really thankful for everyone that's joining us via live stream. We know we have a, a large audience that's out there coming to us and being a part of our service via the, the uh, live stream technology, and we're thankful for that, for everyone that's, that's with us this morning. Our purpose is very clear. We want to worship God, and uh, we're going to do that in spirit and in truth. That's our prayer and our hope. We want you to uh, lift up your voices this morning. Those of you that are here in this auditorium, we, we need singers. We need everyone to lift up their voice and, and praise God and be a part of this service this morning. We're very blessed and we're very fortunate and uh, we're very thankful for our Southgate family, for the patience that everyone's shown and had and continues to display, for all the cooperation, uh, everything that it's taken. There's been a lot of work, a lot of uh, planning and certainly a, a lot of prayer to get us to this point. So I'm very thankful for the Southgate family, for the fact that we've come to this place and God has blessed us to be here. There's no doubt about that. Let's pray before we begin our worship. Lord God, our Father in heaven, we do want to give you glory and honor and praise this morning. We thank you for bringing us together physically and virtually. We know that you love us and that you're with us that your presence is in our lives at this moment in every way. We pray, Father, that you'll bless us to lift up our voices to sing and to praise you. Help us to open our minds and our hearts to consider your word, to listen to the teaching that we're going to have from John. We ask your blessings upon him. Help us to have uh, <clears throat> minds that want to know what your will is for us, to be prepared to serve you, to respond to your word, as we need to, each one of us this morning. We thank you for giving us hope and for all the blessings that come through Jesus Christ. We pray, Father, that you'll help us as a church and as individual Christians to show Jesus to this community around us and help to bring more to know him as their Savior. Again, Lord, we thank you for this time of worship, that you brought us safely here that we're able to be together in every way that we're joined this morning. We just pray that you'll bless us and that uh, we will truly glorify you through this worship service. It's in Christ's name we pray, amen. All praise to
Our gracious, loving Heavenly Father, we just approach your throne this morning. So thankful that we can come together, we can assemble as Christians, that we can lift up our voices to you. And Father, we pray that we will lift you up, that we will praise you, that we will give you all the honor, praise, and glory that we can. Father, we pray that this service will be in accordance with your will and will be a sweet sound into your ear. Father, we know that there are many around the world and around this country and around this city who would love to be out this morning but cannot. And Father, we pray for them. We pray that you'll lift their spirits. You'll, we pray that you will give them opportunities to worship through technology. And Father, we pray that, that this service will reach many. And Father, we pray that, that this soon will come to an end, that we can all assemble together, together with you and together with each other and we can fellowship as you would have us. Father, we know that there are many of our congregation who are sick. Father, there's some seriously, and we pray that you will touch them, that you will touch the doctors and nurses that minister to them, that you'll heal their bodies. Father, we know that there are some through this crisis have become weak in faith. And Father, we pray that you will renew their faith, renew their spirit, renew their love for not only you, but for the lost, for this congregation as well. Father, we know that there are those who are bereaved this morning. And Father, we just pray that you'll touch their hearts, that you'll give them comfort, that you'll fill them with the peace that passes understanding. And Father, we pray for our mothers today as this country recognizes mothers. We know that they're very special to us. We know that they are the lifeblood of our, not only our country, but, our, but of each of us. Father, we pray that you will bless all of our mothers, that you'll bless all of those mothers-to-be. And Father, be with those who are without their mothers this morning also. Father, we pray that you'll bless this congregation as we continue to work to find ways that we can worship in spirit and in truth. Father, we pray that you'll bless all of our efforts, that you'll give us wisdom, that you'll give us knowledge, that you'll give us patience with each other. And Father, we just pray that you'll continue to bless us. Father, please bless this congregation in all that we do be with our teenagers, be with our seniors, and be with, with each one of us. Father, most of all, be with the, the lost of this world. Pray that we will have renewed love for them, that we will reach out, that we'll look for every opportunity that we can to spread the borders of your kingdom. Father, continue to be with this congregation. Forgive us when we fail you. It's through Christ we pray. Amen. As our thoughts turn around the Lord's table at this time, let's sing wonderful, merciful Savior before our Lord's Supper devotional this morning. Wonderful, merciful Savior, precious Redeemer and friend, oh, what a thought that a lamb could rescue the souls of men. Oh, you rescue the souls of men. You are the one that we praise. You are the one we adore. You give the healing and grace our hearts always hunger for. Oh, our hearts always hunger for. Counselor, comforter, keeper, Spirit, we long to embrace. You offer hope when our hearts have hopelessly lost our way. Oh, we hopelessly lost our way. You are the one that we praise. You are the one we adore. You give the healing and grace our hearts always hunger for. Oh, our hearts always hunger for. Almighty, infinite Father, faithfully loving your own.
see a lot of folks I haven't seen in quite some time. We're certainly glad that you are here this morning. There are some things that are different. There are some things that are the same. Uh, if you did not pick one of these up on the way in, you will need one of those that contains both the bread and the fruit of the vine. Uh, also, there will uh, not be the passing of any trays here today you like to make the offering, there's a box on the table out in the foyer that you can place your uh, information and your money in at that time. One thing that doesn't change is that we assemble in order to remember what the Lord did for us. And I want to uh, read a passage that's familiar, but I want to take one word out of that and talk about it this morning. This is 1 Corinthians chapter 11, and it's verses 27 to 30. Therefore, whoever eats the bread or drinks the cup of the word of the Lord in an unworthy manner will be guilty of sinning against the body and the blood of the Lord. A man ought to examine himself before he eats of the bread and drinks of the cup. For anyone who eats and drinks without recognizing the body of the Lord eats and drinks judgment on himself. That is why many among you are sick or weak and sick and a number of you have fallen asleep. We've read that. We've heard that a lot of times. But what I want to ask you, when I read that phrase, a man ought to examine himself, what do you think about? Do we look at ourselves? What do we think about ourselves? What, what do we know about ourselves? There are some things that I would like for you to think about with me this morning. Maybe some questions that would help you to understand what we are talking about by examining ourselves. The first thing I would ask you is really at the top of the list. Am I a Christian? It's Christians that are to partake of the Lord's Supper. Ask myself the question, am I really trusting in Christ? You know, he's the one that we receive our salvation from. Ask yourself the question, have I really repented of my sins? It's important one to ask. We may ask ourselves or ask God from time to time to forgive us of our sins, but have we really repented of them? It's a very important question to ask when we're examining ourselves. Have I sought reconciliation with those that I'm having issues with? Jesus taught to leave our gift at the altar and go reconcile to our brother and then come back to worship. Ask yourself the question, do I really have a sincere desire to live the Christian life? And am I really trying to do that? Might ask ourselves the question, is there any disunity in the church because of my actions? And that goes right back up to earlier in this chapter where it looks like the folks that had a little bit more wealth, a little bit more income, that they were uh, eating and drinking everything up before the poor folks showed up to nothing. Have I confessed my sins? Have I confessed maybe my unbelief? Have I prayed for that unbelief to disappear? Ask myself the question, am I really a faithful servant of the Lord? Maybe even more important, is Jesus really my Lord? That's what we focused on all last year. Is the fruit of the Spirit really evident in my life? Along that line, just really what are the attitudes of my heart? Have I got a right heart about me? Are there some things that need to improve as far as my attitudes and emotions are concerned? Am I really approaching this moment in deep humility? 
And here's a couple of questions that I think are real important. Do I really consider the fact that my sins put Jesus on that cross? Do I really understand that Jesus, the Son of God, was crucified on that cross? And have I really examined myself from the standpoint as to how deeply Jesus does love me? I think sometimes it's easy to go through this in a routine motion. But the scriptures are asking us to examine ourselves. Three other little short verses. <clears throat> 2 Corinthians 13, 5. Examine yourself to see whether you are in the faith. Test yourselves. Do you not realize that Christ Jesus is in you unless you fail the test? Galatians 6, 4. Each one should test his own actions. Then he can take pride in himself without comparing himself to somebody else. So when we are saying examine myself, that's what we really mean. Don't think about what your neighbor is doing. Don't think about what your husband, your wife, your children. Think about myself. And the last one, Lamentations chapter 3 and verse 40. Let us examine our ways and test them. And let us return to the Lord. And so we find ourselves wanting. We need to make those changes. That's part of what the Lord's Supper is about. And we need to do that before we take of that. And that's something you can do before you ever come to this building. But that's something that absolutely you can do at this very moment as well. At this time, let's give thanks for the bread. Our Heavenly Father, we come before you at this time thanking you for this opportunity for us to be back together again and to share in this communion. We're especially thankful for the bread at this point in time, which represents Jesus' body. We're so thankful for what he did there on the cross. We know that what he did on the cross would pay the price for our sins and give us the hope of eternal life. Just thankful for the life that he lived, every aspect of it, all the days that he had here on this earth, for the ministry that he had for the three years, teaching people about how to draw closer to you and how to serve you. Thankful for the miracles that we can read and thankful for the parables that he taught us. We're just thankful for the influence that he's had down to this world to this very day. Help us continue to find that very influence in our lives and help our lives to be right with you. We thank you for this bread and this we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Give thanks for the cup now. Our Heavenly Father, we're thankful for this fruit of the vine which represents the blood of Jesus Christ. We know that he died a painful, excruciating death, a very torturous death. We know that certainly he could feel the blood running down his head, down his body. We know that a tremendous amount of blood had already been shed by the scourging that he took. But this is the blood of his new covenant. This is the blood that provides us for the forgiveness of our sins. We often sing, what can wash away our sins? And the answer to that is nothing but the blood of Jesus. We're so thankful for that. Be with us at this moment as we take of this fruit of the vine. Let's pray in Jesus' name. Amen.
you stand with me this morning, let's sing, I stand in awe of you before our lesson. <clears throat> You are beautiful beyond description. Scripture reading this morning will be taken from Psalm 100. Psalm 100. I'll be reading from the New King James Version. Make a joyful shout to the Lord, all you lands. Serve the Lord with gladness. Come before his presence with singing. Know that the Lord, he is God. It is he who has made us, and not we ourselves. We are his people and the sheep of his pasture. Enter into his gates with thanksgiving and into his courts with praise. Be thankful to him and bless his name. For the Lord is good, his mercy is everlasting, and his truth endures to all generations. Thank you, Clint. Wow, it is great to see you guys. Uh, It has been 10 weeks since I've been able to stand in front of you. I have missed so many of you. I've missed seeing your faces. A lot of things have happened over the last 10 weeks, but we're all blessed to be back here. Uh, Today's a special day for a lot of different reasons. It's Mother's Day, and we're so thankful for our mothers and all that they mean to us. I also got a a text from Jerry Wilson this morning. This is the 67th anniversary of the beginning of the Eastside Church of Christ, which is now the Southgate Church of Christ. So as a church family, we're sort of celebrating the time that individuals came and and did that. And I was just thinking about that this morning. Uh, 67 years. We've got some young folks in this building that may be here when we're talking about uh, 134 years. Uh, What is the church going to be like here in Columbia? It determines, it's going to be determined by what we do and what we do today and how we live our lives. And we're going to be able to pass on a continued legacy as well. I'm so thankful for all of you that are able to be here at the building, but I'm also thankful for all those that are joining online uh, and are continuing to faithfully seek to serve the Lord and commune with Him uh, as, they are, as they are at home. Uh, I've been really encouraged during this time of individuals who have made worship a priority, who've made Bible study a priority, who have continued to strive to keep connect- their connection with the Lord uh, during this time. Last week was the first time in six weeks that I was able to worship with my family uh, on, on a Sunday morning because with Joe preaching, I was able to be at home with them. But it's also the first time in six weeks that I've had to do what most of you have had to do, which is watch it and see it on a screen. And that's not something that's easy. It's not something to, you know, that's, that's an easy thing to do to keep our focus and to make sure that's a priority. Now, if you think it's difficult to worship watching a screen, try watching your own face on a screen. 
Okay, now that is when it gets very, very difficult. Uh, so of all people, as we come together, I'm thankful uh, that we're here in person. Uh, but when it comes to worshiping, we don't want to miss it, do we? Uh, we want to continue to make sure that we give God the honor and praise that he deserves. I don't care if there's tapes on the pews. I don't care how spread out we are. I'm just glad that we're back together. Can I get an amen on that? All right, it's good to be together. Um, we've wanted it. We've wondered when it was going to happen. Uh, we've been waiting and wondering when exactly this uh, day would come. I didn't know how I would respond when we all got to come back together. Uh, it was emotional for me just being here. It's a beautiful thing. God's people together, getting to worship together, getting to lift up our voices to him. Uh, he's worthy of our praise. He's made us a family and for us to be able to be together, it's just a special, special time. Well, during the last eight weeks, I've watched a lot of different worship services. I don't know if you guys have done that as well. Uh, we've had the opportunity to do what we're offering online, but there's a lot of different churches uh, that are offering a lot of different things. I believe one of the bl blessings of this uh, whole ordeal has been, I believe Jesus is out there in public more than he has ever been as far as teaching as far as videos, as far as what's happening on social media, as far as what people are saying about a number of different things. There's been a renewed focus on that. We've had a renewed focus with that here at Southgate as well, and it's been a blessing. But I've also had a lot of time to think about worship. Uh, what's the best way to help others worship? What is worship really all about? And that's what I want to talk to you about this morning. Uh, tonight's lesson on video is uh, looking at a song about worshiping a holy God. And it's just a song talking about that we ought to come together and cry out and sing holy and worship him. Well, this morning I want to sort of ask this question, how do I do that? And I want this lesson to be a reminder for all of us, whether we're here or online, of what does it mean to worship. The Greek word, as you're looking in the New Testament for worship, is a word that simply means to kiss. To kiss, and specifically it's sort of like the idea of to kiss maybe the hand of a superior. You would think of coming before someone that was greater to you than you, and you are offering allegiance, you are offering service, you are offering adoration to someone as if you were taking their hand and you were going to kiss it. And as we come together, we come to worship God. Uh, I want to talk to you this morning about what worship is and what it isn't. And here are some things, I guess, as we begin, what worship is not. With all the different things that have been out there when it comes to worship, one thing that worship is not is, it is not about consumption. Worship is not about consumption. You think about that when it comes to videos, we have our favorite television shows, we have things that we see and we're sitting there and we're looking to uh, be entertained, we're looking for something that we can have, but true worship, whenever it comes to true worship, true worshipers are not consumers, they're participants. We can't ever give in to the idea that worship is going to be about what I'm going to get. When we come together, we've come to sing praises to God. I was so thankful for the songs that Greg picked for us this morning. Because what were they doing? They were singing. They were giving to God the worship that he is deserving of. Christians come together to participate in offering of worship to God. We don't come together to watch others do it or to let someone else worship for us and for us to be a spectator or to cheer them on. Whenever it comes to the idea of worship, it is something that we are going to do ourselves. I've seen some pretty interesting things when it comes to online worship. I was watching one congregation, and uh, with their video offering, they had all these different things going on. Included within that time of worship was an exercise session. An exercise session. They switched to a guy who was there. And he led everyone via video through exercise, including jab, 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 side bend, side bend. I, I couldn't make it up if I wanted to. But you start thinking, okay, where was the thought process behind all of this? It's very easy to start trying to think about the idea of consumers if it was just going to be about numbers and trying to make other people want to be a part of what's going on. But see, that's not what worship is about. Worship is not about us consuming something for us. Worship is about us making a decision that I'm going to give something back to our God, that we're looking to serve Him. 
Consumer, consumerism, when it comes to worship, can become very, very dangerous. Because as a church, what are you going to do? You're going to do whatever the consumer wants. We're not interested. We're blessed when we come together to worship. We receive numerous benefits from worship, but our main purpose in worship is to give, not to receive. We're here, as we've already stated, to honor and to glorify God, to humble ourselves before Him and to honor Him. Worship is not about consumption. Worship is also not about production. Uh, we live in a world where we have many great tools to help us communicate. And as much as I am uncomfortable seeing myself on a video, I am thankful that we have the ability to communicate messages, to communicate truth, to communicate scripture and God's word uh, through this difficult time. Uh, when it comes to a church, when a church comes together, when we come together online, and we're going to attempt to communicate through that. I think we do need to do the best that we possibly can. We need to make sure that we do the best we can as we communicate the gospel in the most effective way possible. Uh, now, we're not a TV studio by any means right now. But we do feel the responsibility to do the best we can. And that's why we've made a lot of efforts along those lines. We do know Paul's words in 1 Corinthians chapter 9, verses 22 and 23. When he says, I've become all things to all people so that by all possible means I might save some. I do this for the sake of the gospel that I may share in its blessings. Jesus was talking about the idea that with different individuals, I'm going to do what I can to try to reach them. To the weak, I'll become weak. To the Jews, he was going to be Jewish. To those that were Gentiles, he was going to try to reach them in their own way. So as we come together and as we put things out to try to reach others, we are going to consider who they are and we're going to try to do the best we can to reach them. Our world is increasingly becoming a place where people need and want and get their information online. And we need to be as effective as possible as we can in our efforts to reach them. So while our digital offerings take a lot of time and energy, I'm really thankful for so many others that have come and made, uh, made so many improvements in what we're doing. We, we do have to always realize that worship is not a production. What do I mean by that? By that I mean worship is not to be something that creates a product that's produced with the purpose to make men want to worship God or to create a bigger crowd. Worship is for believers. When we come together, the reason I hope that you are here is because you believe in God Almighty. You believe that He sent His only begotten Son for you. You believe that He loves the world in, such a, in so much to the extent that He was willing to give His only Son. And because of that, you know that He is worthy of our worship. God has already done all that is needed in order to be worthy of praise. The church's job is to hold up our Lord and Savior. The church's job is to teach others about who He is. To live a life that draws others to him and to come to know him. Because when they come to know him, they're going to have a desire to worship him as well. Our primary goal is not to get others to like worship. We want them to love our Lord. So as we come together to worship, he is the purpose of our worship. He is the reason that we're here. God is worthy of our best. And a church that's not doing their best to reach the community, a church that's not doing our best to try to go out and make sure we're sharing the gospel, is missing the point. But we have to understand that worship is not about production. It's about believers. We want to share the gospel with them so they can believe. And when they believe, they'll want to worship. Ultimately, worship is an individual act that every believer is going to be called on to be a part of in order to give honor and glory to God. The last thing I would say to you about what worship is not this morning is worship is not about a man-made tradition. When we come together and you see a lot of things that have changed, worship is not limited by how we used to do things or how we've done things in the past. Worship isn't about how we take up our collection, how many services we have, when they're going to take place, what you're used to, where you like, where you sit. It doesn't matter about all those things. Worship, those are just traditions that we have, but that is not what worship is about. Worship isn't about a place. This is a great building. We love this facility, but if a tornado took it out this week, worship's going on. Southgate Church of Christ will continue to worship God. We're going to continue to focus on Him. It's not going to be about where we do that. A faithful person is going to offer meaningful worship wherever he or she finds himself and whatever the situation. Worship is going to be about what we are doing within our hearts. Worship isn't about numbers. 
It can be done by somebody who is alone or with us, only with our families. It is great to have a number of people here. But as you look in scriptures, you see a number of people when it came to worship. It wasn't about the number of people that were there or who they were gathered with. You think of Abraham going to, a, to the promised land. As he's traveling to a place that he's never seen before, what does he do? He has times where he's going to be worshiping. He's going to be there just simply with his family. You think of Noah getting off of the ark and he's going to worship. Is it going to be about a crowd? Absolutely not. He's there with his family. He's worshiping God because uh, God is worthy. I think of Jonah. Jonah chapter 2. He's in the bottom of, a, of the water in a fish. And what's he doing? He's offering up sacrifice of prayer to God. He's trying to lift up God in prayer. Uh, Wednesday night we studied online with, about Paul and Silas in Acts chapter 16. By themselves, stuck in stocks, after taking a beating, stuck in prison. But what are they doing? They're worshiping God. So while we love our gatherings and we're blessed to have them, we have to realize that worship is going to happen in the life of a faithful Christian regardless of circumstance and regardless of location. Uh, sometimes with tradition we have to be careful because tradition can reduce our worship to just checking a box. I hope that we never come to worship and say, look, I've done what I was supposed to do. Our Christian lives and our walk with God is not reduced to what we're going to do for four hours during the week. Our Christian walk with God is going to be so much more than that. Coming together for worship shouldn't be our attempt to get credit in our spiritual piggy bank or the idea that we're going to try to make ourselves good enough for God. God has already paid the price for us. We want to come to worship in order to focus on Him and give Him glory. We love to gather to worship God, but worshiping God is not the sole work of the church or the biggest thing God's looking for in our lives. So as we come together today, we're going to be able to offer up praise to him, but we have a lot to do the rest of our lives when it comes to focusing on him. A Christian's life has to be about God, has to be about his will for their life, not just gathering at a building. Look at Mark chapter 12, verses 34 and 33 and 34. Here a man had come up with Jesus and he was talking to Jesus about what the greatest commandment was and Jesus had asked him, uh, well you sort of tell me the answer, what do you think? And the man says this, to love him, God, with all your heart, with all your understanding and all your strength and to love your neighbor as yourself is more important than all burnt offerings and sacrifices. When Jesus saw that he had answered wisely, he said to him, you're not far from the kingdom of God. Jesus had turned the question back to this man and said, what's it really about? And he didn't talk about the temple. He didn't talk about what he would do when he came to Jerusalem. He said, well, I think what's most important, what God wanted, was for us to love him with all that we have and to love our fellow man. And you see what he says, that's more important than all the burnt offerings and sacrifices. This is an important thing that we're doing this morning, but this is not the most important thing that we're doing. As a church family. We can't ever say look as a church. We're reduced to what happens here on Sundays. Or what happens on Wednesday night. As a church we come together. Because of our lives that are serving God. We're trying to love him with all that we have. We're trying to help our fellow man. And then we come here together to give him praise as well. But let's not make it where this. Is what the church is about. The church does not stop. After we leave the building. If we come to worship but we're failing to live our daily lives in a way that loves God and our fellow man, then we're missing the point. If we ever get caught up thinking that worship and Bible study is the only job of a church, then it's going to become very easy to become like the religious people of Jesus' day. Because if all it is is about gathering here, all it is is about what we're going to do on Sunday morning or Sunday night or Wednesday night, if that's going to be it, we can come together, do what we're supposed to do, move on throughout the week and miss the point. Look at what Jesus said in Matthew chapter 15, verses 8 and 9. See, people in Jesus' day, they were sort of given into that idea. They had their tradition. They had where they were going to worship. And they thought, well, we worship the right God in the right place, so we must be all right. But Jesus, as he talked about him, he quotes Isaiah because it was true in the Old Testament. It was true in Jesus' day, and we have to be careful that it's not true today. These people draw near to me with their mouth, and they honor me with their lips, but their heart is far from me. In vain they worship me, teaching as doctrines the commandments of men. What had they done? They sort of gotten into their mind what it meant to serve God. They'd gotten in their mind their own traditions and what they thought would, what it meant to be a good faithful follower of God and they were missing it. 
Because they thought it was about the gathering. They thought it was just about, look, I go to the temple. I'm serving the right God. That's it. And Jesus was saying, no, it's about your heart. You can come here, but what God wants is for your heart to be with Him. Your heart to be loving Him. Your heart to love your fellow man. God wants us to come and celebrate and honor the gift of His Son. Acknowledge what He's already done for us. But He wants us to leave and live lives that follow His will as well. I really could have narrowed down this whole part of the lesson and probably saved you a lot of time by saying this. Worship is not about you. Right? Worship is not about me. It's about God. We don't come to consume it. We don't come to produce it. We don't come and just do what we've always done, just go through the motions of it. It's coming to approach a holy God and to give Him honor and glory. As we look at the second half of the lesson, I want you to open up to Psalm 100. Psalm 100, well, if it's not about us, what's it about? Well, I'm speaking to the choir here. Worship is about God. But Psalm 100 is going to give us three things that I want to remind you that worship is about. It's a call to worship. It teaches us many things about worship whenever you look there uh, within the Psalms. But the first thing that you see within it is that worship is about participation. God never tells us to be spectators of other people's worship. Many people in the world today go to watch others worship. He calls us to worship. We're to be participants in offering worship. That's whether it be a song, whether it be a prayer, whether it be our offering and our giving, Christians are going to come and say, I want to give to God and I want to participate in it. What does he say in verse 1? It says, make a joyful shout to the Lord, all ye lands. Serve the Lord with gladness. Come before his presence with singing. Now, I will say I like King James Version on this one because it just says make a joyful noise. Uh, there's a lot of notes that I can't hit. I can always make a joyful noise. I like that one. But what does he say? He says, look, we're going to come. We're going to be joyful as we come into God. Make this joyful noise, this joyful shout to the Lord. Serve Him with gladness. Come before His presence with singing. When we look in Scripture and we see people worshiping God, what do you see? You see participants. You see people that come together and they're going to offer up, as the Hebrew writer says, we're going to give Him the fruit of our lips as a sacrifice to Him. We come and participate in worship. God expects us all to join in when it comes to worship. It's not going to be that spectator sport. We're all called to exalt our God and celebrate His goodness. We're to express the joy that He's given us. One way that we do that in so is in song. If we're looking in Ephesians 5, 19, Colossians 3, 16, it teaches us that when we're filled with the Spirit, what are we going to do? We're going to teach and admonish one another. Psalms and hymns and spiritual songs, we're going to sing with melody in our heart to the Lord. Why? Because that's going to represent what God has done for us. So worship is a time of participation. It's also a time of contemplation. Contemplation is just the action of looking thoughtfully at something for a long time. Joe, I appreciated your thoughts this morning when it came to thinking about our Lord. What were we doing? We were stopping and we were asking questions. We're contemplating Jesus Christ and what He has done. We're contemplating what I have done. We're contemplating my last week, the thoughts in my mind and my approach to my service to Him. It's a time of contemplation. When we worship, we get to focus on spiritual things and focus on God's will. Look at verse 3 there in Psalm 100. Know that the Lord, He is God. It's He who has made us and not we ourselves. We are His people and the sheep of His pasture. What happens when we come together? We put everything in proper focus. We reset our priorities or we make sure that our priorities are where they ought to be in such a way that we realize that He is our God. He's leading us. He's watching over us. He's protecting us. He's going to take care of us. He's going to make sure we have the things that we need. We can find comfort in that. We're to find joy in that. We're to find strength in that. We know that we're not alone and He is there with us. He is our God. It's not us. We're not in control of this. He's watching out after each one of us. And this will cause us to give thanks. What does he say in verse 4? Enter his gates with thanksgiving. Into his courts with praise. Be thankful to him and bless his name. 
We need to be guided by the Lord so we come to seek Him. We come to learn His will. Our time together helps us in our collective efforts to serve the Lord and accomplish His will as a church. As we come together and think about being His people, we have to be thinking about what can His people, what can we do as a church, do for those in the community? What can we do to serve one another? What can we do to check up on each other? What can we do to watch out for each other? We have a purpose as we come together to bless Him, to be a holy people. To be a light in the community. Or be a place where the lost can be found. So whether you're at home or whether you're here, make sure that you are engaging in a time of deep contemplation. Find your time, find your focus, and make sure that God is the purpose of what you're doing. Finally, I would say that worship is a time of supplication. Supplication is the act of asking or begging for something earnestly or humbly. As we come together, sometimes we just need help. Sometimes we just need a blessing. Sometimes we come together and we just need to get our minds right. We just need the strength from the Lord in our inner man. We just need to know that everything's going to be all right. Look at verse 5. What do we see? The Lord is good. That'd probably be a good thought all week long just to get up every morning and say, The Lord is good. Whatever you're going to deal with that day, know that He's good. Whatever you're dealing with as far as struggles, know that He is good. When you look at the blessings of your life and if things are going well, know that it is a blessing from the Lord and He is good. But it goes on to give us other things that we ask for many times. His mercy is everlasting and His truth endures to all generations. When we come to worship, we come and acknowledge God's goodness. We ask for His mercy, and we seek His truth. And I want to encourage you to remember those facts. Know that the Lord is good. That's why we worship Him. We have a good Father who wants to walk with us through every step of the way. His mercy is everlasting. When we've fallen short, when we've been less than what we've been called to be, when we have fallen into sin, His mercy is is everlasting. He offers it because of His great love with which He loved us. We deserve punishment, but He is willing to forgive us of our sins, and instead He offers mercy, and His truth endures to all generations. The truth of the matter is that we serve a merciful God. We serve a God who wants to extend mercy, but judgment day is coming. Right now, for each one of us, you are either under the shield of God's mercy or you are not. You are either coming to honor and glorify the one who has forgiven you of your sins or you're not. You're on one of two roads. You're on one of two paths. You're either going to be right with him right now or you're not. The truth is, each and every one of us are on a path either to heaven or hell. Maybe during the last few weeks you've had a lot of time to do some self-contemplation. You have a lot of time to think about what you're going to do. You may have had a lot of time that the devil's been working on you. And he's been trying to get you as well. But as you've thought about those times and now we have an opportunity to come together, what do we want to do? We want to give you an opportunity to respond to the Lord. This morning there may be a lot of folks that need to respond to the Lord. It may be that you're just needing prayers and you're needing strength. That's why we're together, is to strengthen each other. It may be that you need to make a turn in your life and say, look, I need, I need help with this. I need encouragement with this. I need, the Lord's, I need the prayers of the Lord's church with this. I want to be a better person. And maybe today is the day that you need to be restored back to Him. Maybe somebody's here today and they know that they haven't received the mercy of the Lord. They haven't received forgiveness because they're not yet a Christian. Once you're a Christian, all of these things come. So maybe today is a time for your supplication, a humble and earnest plea for God's mercy to shine in your life. Today is an opportunity. We've been blessed with this great opportunity to come together, but you, we also have an opportunity to make sure that we're right. If we can help you in any way, we invite you to come as we stand and as we sing. Burns on earth at a Calvary, Jesus is very dear. Burns on earth at a Calvary, Calvary, Calvary. Burns on earth at a Calvary, Jesus is very dear.
Hannah Hill has come forward this morning. She said, during this time away, uh, she says, I've really fallen away. I haven't watched the videos and things like I should have, and she just wants to be back on the right path. And Hannah, we thank you for your heart, and thank you for your desire to do what's right. It's a difficult time, and I think it's so important for us to reach out to each other and to check on each other. Uh, even as we do it, when we do the best we can, we're still sitting there and it is just a hard thing to focus on. It's a hard thing to get our heart right and our mind right. But I appreciate Hannah and her soft heart and her desire to, uh, uh, to share that with us and to ask for strength. Hopefully we'll be able to be back and continue to be here together and give each other the strength that we need as well. I'm going to ask Jim Pollard, if you will, to come up and pray on Hannah's behalf. Let's pray. Our most dear Heavenly Father, we come before you thanking you for your great love and mercy and kindness you show to us. Lord, we realize that oftentimes that we're weak and we struggle. We have things in this world that distract us. And we just pray, dear Lord, that you will help us to overcome those. Lord, we pray for Hannah at this time. We pray you give her strength. We pray, dear Lord, that you give her uh, a renewed faith. And we pray, dear Lord, that for all of us, that we will continually seek to be the servants that you would have us to be, that we will put away the things of the world, the temptations the devil puts before us, and maybe we'll be able to focus on you, put away the distractions of this world. Dear Lord, because we know that being obedient to you and following you is what matters and what will save us. We thank you, dear Lord, for the great gift of salvation you gave us through Jesus Christ, your Son your perfect son who you sent to sacrifice for us. Even though we weren't worthy, dear Lord, you love us that much and your grace and mercy is extended to us and we're thankful for that. We pray that you continue to go with us, continue to strengthen us. Help us, dear Lord, uh, to be the servants that you would have us to be. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. Sing a common love as we close this one. A common love for each other. So many blessings we take for granted in our lives uh, through the years, but our religious freedom and the fact that we have this wonderful facility and we have all of the blessings that God has given us to, to be together from time to time and worship Him, it's something I think we'll all look at differently from this point forward, so it's a good thing. We will be using this format and this schedule, at least uh, for the foreseeable future. So. Uh, I would ask that you pay attention and, and continue to, to look for emails and uh, information uh, via the uh, uh, website and uh, those, those communications will be what we'll use to tell you guys about how anything might change. But for the foreseeable, we'll use this, this format and this schedule uh, as we go through this phase of, of re-entering somewhat of a normal uh, life, I guess. We do have our classes that will begin uh, at 9.30. We have uh, pretty much the same lineup that we've had uh, uh, via live stream and, and Zoom and others. But So at, uh, Joe Mason will be teaching via the Southgate live stream at 9.30. Ben McGreevy will be teaching the teen class through Zoom, YouTube, and Instagram Live. We'll send that information out by text and Facebook. 
Young Professionals Bible class will meet on Zoom at 9.30. Uh, Jim Pollard will be teaching his class via Zoom at 9.30. Sam Quirk, Logan Prentice, and John Allen Thomas will be teaching a college class on Zoom. Uh, there'll be no Zoom classes for children. The, uh, John Thomas will have a PM lesson uh, this evening on the Southgate YouTube page, and that will be at 5.30 p.m. So here uh, in just a few minutes, we're going to be doing a, a, a cleaning of our facility. We ask everyone to, to go ahead and, and uh, once we dismiss, to, to leave the facility. We're thankful for Sonny Hobbs and taking leadership in that and others that are going to volunteer and be a part of it. But I feel like cleaning between the services is, is the right thing as a part of our overall plan. So that will take place and the building will be reopened at 1015 for those that are coming for the 1030 worship service. Um, we do have one announcement to add, uh, Ms. Patsy Tyree, who we've been praying for these last several days. She's back at Centennial Hospital. She was taken back there on Friday. So we want to remember Patsy. And there are many others. Again, look to the emails for full information of, of uh, all of our sick or other uh, extra announcements that need to be made really grateful for everything that's brought us together this morning for hannah and her tender heart and her example and for all that we've been able to do and experiences of congregation this morning we've been blessed let's close in word of prayer father god lord we thank you for uh, the beautiful day for the fact that we can sit here and witness your majesty out these windows and and pray and sing and, and worship you together in an assembly we're thankful for those that have joined us via live stream and for the fact that you're with us all we just are amazed by your power and your presence and your greatness we know that you are the cre creator and sustainer of our lives we ask lord that you would bless our community and the world around us as we continue to face the impacts of the pandemic we pray, Lord, for uh, peace, for the patience among all people, and for perseverance as we continue to try to take steps forward into the next phases of uh, the appropriate response to this pandemic. Lord, we pray uh, continually for a vaccine, for treatments. We ask that you would bless the medical and pharmaceutical communities that are working towards these uh, tools to help us to fight the, the coronavirus in the future. We ask, Lord, that you would help us to all be um, vigilant in every way, that we would be considerate of our fellow man and use this time to show Christ living in each of us individually and collectively as your church. Father, we do just want to thank you for uh, giving us the, the church for the blessing of, of uh, fellowship, for the blessing of having brothers and sisters that know you and have put their faith in you for our uh, common hope and our common love that we have. Lord, we thank you for Jesus who died and bought uh, this church, paid that price that we could never pay. We thank you for the shedding of his blood and for the forgiveness of sins that comes only because of him. We thank you for Hannah who, who uh, came forward this morning to uh, to ask for your blessings and we just ask lord that you would touch her and bless her in every way that she needs we know there are many others that that uh, have responded uh, privately and we just pray father that you'll help us to each one continually examine our lives against your word to be right with you and to glorify you in everything we do we ask all this in the name of christ amen